And what were the after effects of tonight's madness? What would become of tonight's madness? No sooner than an hour after I got home, there was a knock at the door. I looked out my fresh window above the laundromat and saw it was Esham. I thought 100% for sure he was gonna jump me with his boys and just whip my ass for dissing him on stage. Rappers might be rappers, but being in the rap game does anything but take the street out of somebody. Believe me, I thought about it and I was like, fuck it. If I don't go out there, they might bust up Lori's car or whatever. Fuck it, I thought, I'll just have to go out there and get it over with. I walked outside and stood there expecting to get attacked at any second from behind or from wherever. Nope, it was just Esham chilling alone. He asked me, did you say something about me on stage tonight? I said, fuck yeah I did, man, why wouldn't I? Look what you said about Alex. Look what you did to us. He said, cause I ain't with that rap battle shit. We can handle this right now. He pulled out a cat. Right off the bat, I knew Esham was smarter than that. I was also assaulted that he figured I was bitch made like Kid Rock probably would have been. I said to him, come on man, I just said fuck Esham on stage two hours ago. And then suddenly I wind up shot dead. Hmm, I wonder who did it. I know you ain't stupid enough to fucking shoot my ass. I know you're pissed off, and I would be too. Fuck man. What the fuck would you have done if somebody would have pulled that shit off at your show? What if I was like, fuck Mr. James, yo, you would have ran out there and busted my ass, right? Well, what the fuck? This is my camp, my fam, my show, and we love Alex, just like you do James. You dissed him on stage at our show that we spent the last two months trying to get everybody to come see. Damn right I dissed you back. I had to. We would have looked like bitch boys if we didn't. Look at what you were pissed over. Because he cut your shit off. You should have just came and confronted us about it before acting crazy like that. Esham is a man. We sat there and settled our differences like men. Just him and I in that dark ass street corner in Detroit City for over an hour. After we handled our hot head shit, we talked about the show and all that. As strange as it may sound, we left that night with a great deal more respect for one another. Esham coming out to my house with a gun in 1993, and later he'd end up signed to Psychopathic and swinging the hatchet by my side. It's just amazing to me. Three things to remember from this. Number Number one, God is way bigger than all of us. Number two, never say never and mean it. And number three, life is too fucking long to be stuck on stupid. People talk to Esham and I about leaving that part out of the book altogether. Plus, we have never ran from anything in our personal histories. We're both too fucking proud of ourselves today, of how we turned out to care about what happened on the streets over a decade ago. Up until that historical magic bag show, we were just another rap back or something. Or what we thought was a rap act. That night, after going against the venue's rules, after the fago and the stage diving, we weren't just a fucking rap act anymore. We were ICP in the dark corner. We never again fell into any plain old category, but that one, our own category. We weren't being anything but ourselves. Fago, fuck yous and all. ICP was truly born. More importantly, the Juggalos were born, all 350 or so of them. That night, the Magic Bag, Shaggy Too Dope, Violent J, ICP, the Dark Carnival, and the Juggalos all came to life. Chapter 11, Ringmaster's Word. And this chapter is dedicated to Young Wicked, the man behind the boards right now, adding all the little extra freshness you hear here and there behind my words. Whoop whoop! We had the Beverly Kills 50187 EP between albums, and we weren't basically poor anymore. We weren't rich at all. We weren't even middle class. But for the very first time in my life, though, we weren't dirt poor. We could afford McDonald's or whatever was right down the street from our office anytime we wanted. Our office was still Alex's mom's basement on Nine Mile Road. Carnival of Carnage had sold almost 10,000 copies by now. 10 fucking thousand copies, all independently. Despite the big news, however, Alex came back from a music seminar with some bad news. 
like we didn't have any record companies sucking our dicks. Damn. As a matter of fact, we didn't have anybody sucking our dicks. Anywhere we went, every record store, every time we hung out at St. Andrew's Hall, nobody had a fucking thing to say to us. Nothing but mean mugs and shoulder shrugs everywhere we went. Whatever we told people we sold, they were always dead certain we were lying about it. Besides, every time I talked to Esham's brother James, he would tell me they were selling a hundred thousand records. Same thing with Kid Rock. Oh yeah, I'm at about 70,000 units. We believed it all too. Sure, we'd later learn that they were mega hyping that shit up the whole time. Right then, we all thought that we had a lot of catching up to do. Them lying to us all, all those years, that turned out to be the best thing ever for us. Because all we did was try harder and harder to catch up to their imaginary record sales. Them lying, them boosting their record sales, just made us work harder to try to catch up to their lies. The truth was, all along, it was hard enough for fucking Ice Cube to sell 10,000 records in the Detroit area, let alone a local group. It didn't matter to us, though. We really didn't care. Ice Cube was our target. Now, him and the Beastie Boys, all the big time shit, that's what we were trying to catch up to. We entered the studio to make the second Joker's card, the Ringmaster. Mike E. Clark was still pretty much busy as hell back then, treating us like hoes. But we still entered the studio with him because he was the best thing in Detroit, period. About Mike. Don't get me wrong, Mike Clark was never a dick to us. Mike was never a dick to anybody for that matter. He was always friendly as hell, full of energy, and full of life. You gotta know Mike, he's full of charisma and karma. He's super, super cool and all, but he was just so fucking busy. From the first day I ever met Mike, he was always cool as hell to chill with though. His only problem back then was he was so fucking busy and in demand. He couldn't work with us exclusively because we weren't making any real money. So Mike had to work with about 10 bands at that time in order to make all his end meets. And when I say bands, I do mean bands, rock and roll bands, and rap groups. The fact is, Mike is the fucking bomb and everybody who has ever worked with him wants him for themselves alone. But during the recording of Ringmaster, we were just one of the 10 bands Mike was doing at the time. That's why I say we were just bitches to him. That and the fact that we were just another one of the many rap groups and bands who were always bugging him for studio time. He was moving up in the world though. He had his own studio now. He didn't have to rent out a room at the Temper Mill studio. He had his own fucking studio right at his house. We buried ourselves in the studio as much as possible. Shit was magical during this period. Because we knew we actually had people waiting for this album. We were actually defining what ICP was and what it could be. We wanted to make a statement to direct our energy. We wanted to mix comedy and horror and hold it all up like a mirror to a city full of gangsters and scrubs just like us. The image of the Joker's car came to me as a ringmaster throwing up the forks up and the forks down gang signs. To us, that meant that all sets, all gangs could have clown love. That's why the ringmaster holds up both signs. You see, in Detroit, in the southwest side especially, there were several gangs. The Cash Flow Posse, the Latin Counts, all sorts of them. They were either Forks Up Gang or Forks Down Gang. Sort of like out in LA, you got a bunch of different gangs that are either Crip or Blood. They may have individual sets or streets they represent or neighborhoods they represent, but they're either Blood, which means they get along with other Blood gangs, or they're either Crip, which means they get along with other Crip gangs. Well, here in the Midwest, in Chicago and Detroit, it's about Forks Up or Forks Down. Several different gangs were either Forks Up or they were Forks Down. And that's why the ringmaster threw up bull signs because he was representing all sets. I don't know where the hell we got all those fresh ideas except to say from the Dark Carnival. We even decided to put our own comic book out with the ringmaster called The Wicked Clowns. I wrote it and Joey drew it. Once again, we were hanging out up at Kinko's like curly hairs on nuts when we weren't in the studio. That fucking comic book was hella, hella hard work. We spent more time up at Kinko's than ever during the Ringmaster era, and that's saying a lot. 
We had to get the comic book printed in Canada, so it took us a million trips across the border to smuggle them all back. At least we had a comic book now. It wasn't in color or anything, but the cover was, and it was funny. Not even Ice Cube had a fucking comic book. Right from the rip, we wanted to be about more than just music. We wanted to have all kind of little trinkets and little fucking collectibles that come along with us. Not just the CDs, but all kinds of additional collectible flavor. That's why right then during the Ringmaster era, way back in 1990 fucking three or four, we were drawing a comic book and it took Shaggy forever to draw that bad boy. And it's still available today. It's a collector's item and it should be because it's fucking dope and it's fucking funny as hell, straight up. We were off on our own thing now and making new moves. We finally stopped watching our opponents in the race. We just looked ahead and little did we even know it, but we were leaving everybody in the dust, promoting, 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 nonstop, night and day, day and night. We hustled at every Kinkos in the state. We even went to Kinkos in other states just to reuse our snaky tactics because they weren't hit to us yet. We sat up at Kinkos so much that my ass was shaped just like the bottom of a Kinkos chair. We brought our own chairs into the Kinkos that we kept in Alex's truck. We brought food to Kinkos, ordered fucking pizzas to Kinkos, all that. I'm telling you, we lived at Kinkos, making endless amounts of demo packages, flyers, fan club newsletters, bios, everything. It's all about work, you fucking jerk. You don't sit around and wait to be discovered, asshole. You fucking work. Bust your ass if you want it. Chase it, make it happen, own it. Don't sit and wait, don't sit and pray, cause God ain't appreciating your lazy ass. Put some effort into it, you bitch. All you fucking local bitch fans that never made it, ha 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 you lazy fuck. Fuck it though, I know all this sounds boring as hell, and if you want, you can skip over to the other chapters about, let's see, how I hung out with Slash, or about how Billy just about blew the guy from Radiohead's grill out, and all that other dirt from being in the WWF and WCW. Skip right ahead, cause this shit is about the struggle, motherfucker. Juggalos, or whoever's hearing this, you've gotta understand, this is what really went on. Promoting, promoting, promoting! the true story behind ICP CDs and concerts. It ain't fresh as them rappers make it seem in the videos. At least for us it never was. We had to walk the whole way alone because nobody else would give us a free lift. You ain't gonna read no rock stars book where motherfuckers are talking about kinkles and flyers and shit as much as us because they never had to deal with that shit. Some did, a little here and a little there, but nobody, nobody out there walked the whole fucking way like we did. No motherfucking buddy. My only point is that you can truly do whatever you want in this world. Even if you never once receive a break along the way, you can still do it. It just takes a lot of fucking work. But you can be an astronaut or you can be an asshole. You can be whatever the fuck you want on this planet. It's true. You just have to to fucking work. The good thing is that once you get to where you're trying to go, you can look back and say, I don't owe shit to any motherfucking buddy. So it might seem stale that I got all these stories about making flyers, promoting, and selling records in Detroit instead of real rock and roll shit like supermodels eating out each other's nettings while we're sipping Caribbean wine and high-fiving with Tommy Lee. Believe me, this shit was hard work. Now, back to our stale story. About seven weeks before we put the Ringmaster out, we drove all the way down to Cincinnati to get the tapes and CDs pressed up. We had to look for a pressing plant that worked for the cheapest, the most product for the lowest amount of money. We fucking shopped. We budget shopped. We checked out every CD and tape pressing plant in the United States. And the cheapest, best bargain was in Cincinnati, Ohio. So we jumped in Alex's fucking rusty ass bucket and we bounced. We chose this place called 
QCA to do the job. I wonder if they're still in business. We wanted to go there personally to show them exactly how we wanted it done. Just like we had done a few years earlier with Dog Beats. Sure enough though, four days before the release of the Ringmaster, we got the CDs and tapes back and they were all fucked up. Typos all over the place, wrong foil and everything. Even though we had to drive all the way there to show them exactly how we wanted it done, they still fucked it all up. At first, they just dissed us about it. They told us, sorry, but there was nothing they could do for us. We were so pissed that somebody was truly about to get hurt. The street came pouring back out of us. It was going down, y'all, for real. We were plotting and planning an actual attack on their pressing plant. Straight up, we were about to bring the streets to the QCA pressing plant in Cincinnati. Right when we got the call, they had made us another 10,000 cassettes and 10,000 CDs for absolutely free. This was like a fucking dream come true. We now had twice the shit to sell. 40,000 units, and we were gonna sell them all. That was a break, and I'll never forget it. Thanks to Alex and his threatening tactics, they actually remade 20,000 more CDs and cassettes. 40,000 in all. 20,000 fucked up ones and 20,000 good ones. And we were about to sell all of them bitches. Now, I will admit, that was a break. But that's only because we threatened them and we were serious about it. We were about to surround them and blow their fucking windows out. And you know I ain't playing. Ringmaster hits the streets and his mighty era began. My brother had now been out of the army for a while doing his thing. He started working with us full time, helping us promote the fuck out of the Ringmaster. Even the fucking army and Desert Storm War couldn't prepare Rob for the amount of work we put in while promoting. He got out of one war just to join another. Yes, he was in Desert Shield and Desert Storm. My brother Rob was all over Kuwait and Iraq and all that shit during that war out in the fucking desert with Scud missiles flying everywhere. It was fucking crazy. He should write his own book just about that. But he is now back out of that war and in this war. Alex's mom basement was now the psychopathic records warehouse and shipping department, as well as the office. When we weren't flyering, we were down there taping up boxes of CDs, shirts, and shipping them out. Check this out. We bought this huge mega roll of duct tape from this used office supply store. It wasn't really duct tape. It was actually more like this thin ass, light brown packaging tape shit. The roll was just enormous. I mean, it was seriously about three feet thick, no lie. I think maybe it was used on some kind of giant box folding machine or something. But now we had it and it was fucking humongous. 30 or 40 pounds of nothing but tape. We all stood around looking at it and we said, by the time this roll of tape is gone, we will have easily shipped out enough shit and sold enough records to get a record deal. We were positive of that. There was no way we could have been wrong about that. So we thought the ringmaster was powerful. Our record was selling. Detroit Scrubs and Thugs were all taking major notice of Insane Clown Posse. Juggalos were emerging from the darkest corners of the state. Other bands were just making music to jam to. We were becoming an underground phenomenon. We set up a bunch of in-store appearances, alone this time, just ICP with no fucking Kid Rocks. At the in-stores, lines of kids were wrapped around the stores twice sometimes. Every kid who came through the line was just like us. They looked like us, they dressed like us, they talked like us and all that. No, I'm not saying that we influenced them in their style. I'm saying that they already had the same style as us. We were all the same kind of people. Scrubs, flubes. We were all being drawn together as underdogs. They were all pissed and ready to do something about it just like us. It felt like we already knew everybody. We seemed like they all wrestled in NAW with us back in the day. 
They were all thugs with ICP for years. It was crazy. It was like we already knew everybody somehow. That's how it felt. All these ninjas coming out to get autographs, they were just like us. Joey and I were finding out that there have always been other people out there who thought, lived, breathed, and chilled the same as we did all along. Our music was just helping us all find each other. It was crazy. We couldn't push it out fast enough. Juggalos were telling future Juggalos about the dark carnival. Detroit was steady shaking. There were many earthquakes everywhere. Something was growing under the dirt. Something powerful, large, and mega was emerging. We kept spreading our juggalo poison. Box after box was leaving that fucking basement. Our fucking fat roll of tape remained fat, but it was definitely being tested. We were blowing up so big, we had to buy an office out in Oak Park so Alex's mom's neighbors didn't think we were drug dealers coming and going out of the house at all hours. It was almost like a dream come true, having our own office. I absolutely loved that little fucking two-room office. I would spend the night there at least two nights a week and just chill, and I hated going home. I used to bring chicks with me there and fuck them on this big-ass conference table all the time. It was so fresh, we used to get chicks from the ICP hotline. That's right, we'd leave them new message every day, and chicks would leave their messages, and we'd call them back and be like, well, what up then? And hook up with them, it was the shit. We even bought our first company car, a little Suzuki sidekick with fat rims and ground effects. You probably don't even remember ground effects, do you? They were the shit. No more getting out of Alex's rusted out caddy in front of everybody at the in-stores. We used that office and fresh-ass car 24-7. Damn, I remember that Suzuki sidekick. It even had the fresh purple neon lights underneath it that were illegal. That's why we always got pulled over in that bitch. But man, we love bouncing that fucking fresh purple Suzuki sidekick with the ground effects and the neon purple lights that you no longer see because they were too distracting, but we were fresh in that bitch. At the ringmaster surface, it was just clear. We owned Detroit's underground. That roll of packaging tape was getting smaller, a little bit smaller. Everything seemed cool except for one thing. Alex, we've now sold 30,000 copies of the ringmaster. Where's that fucking record deal? I asked him. And he said, why don't you go to that big ass Jack the Rapper convention coming up in a couple months and find out. The 1993 Jack the Rapper convention was this big rap industry thing held in Atlanta for all the players and would be players of the rap game willing to shell out a $300 ticket. Rudy and I drove down there thinking we were the shit. By the time the convention came, the ringmaster had sold 40 thousand units all on our own record companies were going to be hanging off our dicks or so we thought little did we realize that absolutely nobody outside of the detroit area had a clue as to the hell we were we sold 40,000 units all right all in metro detroit and around flint when we walked in the hotel where the convention was held Right away we saw every rapper and their mama was standing there slapping stickers of their group everywhere. They were just like us, promoting. We started doing the same thing, slapping our motherfucking posters up all over the walls and just trying to blend in. This wasn't nothing new to us. We had crazy skills at promoting. I remember I went up to Redman and gave him a CD and then the EPMD and any motherfucker who would take it. We walked around that bitch with our chins up like, yeah, we sold 40,000 fucking records. Ringmasters had 40,000. People still weren't hearing it. Every rapper there had a story that beat ours. 40,000 units? That ain't shit, dog. Back in Oklahoma City, me and my crew sold 130,000 units. We couldn't fucking believe it. Everybody was fresher than us somehow. I was getting mad. Rudy just got drunk. We found ourselves on the elevator with Tag Team. You remember them? They had that song, Whoop, there it is. Whoop, there it is. That shit was out and blowing up at the time. So we're in the elevator with them, and it was just about the biggest single of that year. What up, y'all? One guy asked. What up, I said. He put out his hand for depth. Tag Team. Rudy shook his hand. ICP, what up? We started talking that small time bullshit talk people make in elevators, especially at business conventions, and we told them we're from Detroit. 
then one of the guys asked us, so how are we doing up in Detroit? Are we on any radio up there? Rudy, drunk off his ass, answered, well, you know, I ain't really heard too much since that whole little whoop thing y'all did. Wow, I couldn't believe Rudy just said that to them. That whole little whoop thing was the biggest selling rap single of all time. And Rudy just called it a little whoop thing. Well, we hit our floor and got off the elevator right quick. I was just like, holy fuck. Rudy didn't stop to think about what had just happened. He stumbled over to the beer line. Suddenly, Kid, that one guy with the high top fade from Kid and Play, kind of cut in front of him. Rudy liked beer, but he loved trouble. Hey, what's up with that, man? He yelled. Kid apologized immediately. Oh, I'm sorry, bro. I didn't know this was the line. Rudy was drunk. I don't give a fuck if you're a motherfucking kid and play, motherfucker. <laughs> Rudy was about to beat the ninja up from kid and play. I couldn't believe this was happening. It was funny as hell, though. We paid 600 bucks to come here and get a record deal. And all we were doing was burning bridges we never had to begin with. Fuck it. We pissed off tag team and kid and play. Might as well go for the hat trick. Snoop Dogg and his Death Row Records posse were premiering their new movie, Murder Was the Case That They Gave Me. It was kind of a big fucking deal because back then, not every rapper was making many movies like they do now. Rudy stumbled up to the door of the screening room and this big bold letters was a sign, Do not open door. Film in progress. Come on, dog, Rudy said. Let's go see this shit. Let's just wait till the next showing, I told him. Rudy opened both doors, and the darkened room suddenly filled up with light. Suddenly, Snoop and about 50 other people were turning around in their seats to see who the assholes were that just opened the door in the middle of the film. The assholes were Rudy and me. Now, rather than take a seat in the back, Rudy was loud as ever. Oh, my, my, my bad. Now go ahead, watch the movie. The screen's over there. Why are you watching me for shit? Don't mind us. We finally found some seats. Five minutes later, Rudy leaned over and whispered to me, man, it ain't no bitches in here, man. Let's get the fuck out of here, dog. He at least bothered to whisper. Dog, don't go back outside, I begged him. If you open them doors, all that light's gonna fill the fucking room again. Dog, this shit is whack, man. Let's break, bro. By now, people were turning around mean mugging us for talking anyway, so I figured we better leave before we get our asses beat. We ninja to the back, and Rudy threw open the doors again like he was escaping a burning building. Just as the doors closed back up, I, th I thought we were cool, but Rudy suddenly yelled, Southwest, bitch! We ran. <laughs> So fresh. At this point, I had just about enough of this convention, but I figured I'd give it at least one last try. There was a room that had A&R men from all labels who would sit down and talk to you. It was almost closed for the day, and we wanted to get the fuck out of there, so I bribed a kid for his place in line. Think about that. I actually paid this motherfucker 40 bucks to have his place in line to talk to the A&R from the record company. He must have not wanted it as bad as we did because he stepped right the fuck out of line and gave me his spot. I sat down in front of the A&R guy. Here it is, man. I said, handing him a copy of the Ringmaster. I had five minutes to give him my speech. Man, this record sold 40,000 copies in Detroit. Here are photos of the group. Me and my boy wear clown makeup, blah, blah, blah. The guy was just looking at me like, shut the fuck up and get the fuck out of here. He didn't ask me one question. Talking to him was like talking to a telephone pole. All right, we'll listen to it. Peace. Peace my ass. He could have given a shit less. Luckily, on our way back, there was an independent wrestling show in Atlanta, which was pretty fucking fresh. So Jack the Rapper trip was a total waste. Southwest, bitch! We may not have been shit at the Jack the Rapper convention, but back in the D, we were stars again. We booked the show at the Ritz. The same stale-ass place we played for 250 disinterested Eshan fans a year and a half earlier. This time, the building was sold the fuck out at 1,800 Juggalos. We had face paint on, too. Believe that. Not only us, but half the fucking crowd did, too. We had a song on Carnival Carnage called The Juggler. 
Then I would do it on stage, I'd say, you can't fuck with the juggler. What about you, juggalo? Are there any juggalos in here? The fans took it from there. The word juggalo was official. Juggalos were like our very own underground cult of followers. We were the band you never heard on the radio or saw on MTV, but everybody in the area knew the name, and only the juggalos actually listened to us. We were getting so big, we were getting even more player hated in our beloved Southwest. Rudy and I rolled by Clark Park and our sidekick, and people just threw shit at us. Fuck ICP, y'all ain't shit. It was weird as hell. We had some money in our pocket. We were selling out concerts. Our ugly asses even had hot supermodel looking bitches wanting to fuck us. Still, somehow we didn't have a fucking record deal. Yes, we were getting some skins, I'll say right here, but it was all phony skins. It was just groupie skins. You have to understand though, groupie skins are like prostitutes. They're fucking you, but they ain't really fucking you because they want to fuck you. They're fucking you so they can say they fucked you. They're fucking you to get props, just like a hooker fucks you to get money. So groupie sex ain't really fulfilling if you're a real man. If you're a real man, you want a bitch to fuck you because she wants to fuck you. That's good sex when a bitch is scratching your back loving you fuck her. I'm telling you now, as a grown ass man, that's good sex. If a bitch actually really is attracted to you and wants to suck your dick for her pleasure, that's what the fuck I'm talking about. But back then, we would take sex in any fucking form. A hottie willing to fucking blow you real quick in the back of your sidekick? Absolutely. Bring it on. We didn't understand it wasn't authentic though, but we took it any way we could get it. Life was getting busy as hell. We had places to be and projects to get done. Our rapping careers were truly underway. Finally. I had to look ahead and keep moving this life in a new, quicker pace. I broke up with Lori. Remember, we had supermodel looking chicks willing to fuck us now. It was time to move on. And move on I did. I ended up regretting it for years. A long time after Lori, all I ever met was fake ass groupie after fake ass groupie. That made Lori look like an angel. Nowadays, I feel different about Lori. For some reason now, when I look back into the past, all I seem to remember is her bitching at me all the time. I seem to have forgotten her fresh points. I only remember her bitching about the money I owed her, about staying out promoting too late every night, straight up bitching about everything I did. I'm happy as hell now not to be with that stupid bitch. Even though thinking about sex we had, it was all right, it was pretty cool. She was the first woman to ever make me nut by giving me head. But yo, she always made me wear a fucking rubber. How stale is that? My girlfriend always made me wear a fucking rubber. Actually, she was smart, you know what I'm saying? Now that I really, really think about it, because I was fucking plenty other Neddens with no condom. Yes, it's true. When I was in my 20s, I was buck wild. Yes, yes. Yes, she made me wear rubber all the time. What kind of bullshit was that? Anyway, once Lori and I were over, Joey, Billy, and I all decided we should get a place together. At the same time, my brother Rob and Rudy had both also ended long ass stale bullshit relationships. All of us agreed, let's all get a place together and promote 24-7. Fuck the bitches and everything else all around. We were self-sufficient. We were a record company with local hit albums. And all we cared about was making all that grow bigger and better. We couldn't afford anything fresh yet, but we all knew we wanted to live somehow near downtown Detroit, where the fresh shit was always going down. The mecca of all the action. The greatest place to be promoting. We ended up moving into a scrubbiest neighborhood in Detroit, a place known to local crack kids and hookers everywhere. Cass Corridor. Now, just for the record, I must say these days, the Cass Corridor area is much nicer. They built big buildings for college students, and they have all kind of stores everywhere, and it's much, much nicer. But back in these days, it was a fucking crack haven, and it was fucked up. 
It was all drug dealers, freaks, and hookers mixed in with crazy hippie-looking college kids who have the balls and the drug habits to want to live there too. We fucking loved it in Cass Corridor, except for my fucking sidekick always getting broken into. They stole the fucking airbag out of it once. They stole the fucking radio out of it. Rob and Rudy got an apartment with me, Billy, and Joey on the apartment directly across the hall from them. We were on the third floor of a three-floor apartment building-sized crack house. Our rent was 245 bucks a month. Our bathtub always had roaches crawling around and there was never a shower head, which meant to use it, you would have to 